wherever you are around the world. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be exploring the U.S. and Cuban relationship issue. This has been a very contentious issue for a lot of political ideologies. They don't seem to be always agreeing on whether we should be friends with our local neighbors down there 90 miles away from Florida. So we're going to try to talk with an expert, Professor James Lopez. He's professor of Spanish, specializing in Latin American history and literature from the University of Tampa. And welcome to The Circle, Professor Lopez. Thank you very much. Thank you again for being on the show. This has been, uh, I don't know if it's long awaited. I guess some for some it's been long awaited, this relationship with Cuba. But before we start talking about what happened there and if it's good or bad, I wanted to teach the audience or, or at least maybe bring a more awareness of the history of this problem. You know, why do we have such a contentious relationship with Cuba? Um, and maybe we can even explore how Castro even got in there to begin with. Well, you know, I think uh, an important thing is uh, to remember is that the Cuban Revolution uh, didn't happen in a vacuum, that it was very much uh, the result of a, of a series of historical factors and a long, close uh, historical relationship between uh, the United States and Cuba that dates back to the uh, 19th century and, uh, and, and the original uh, struggle for Cuban independence. And so, in many ways, the Cuban Revolution uh, much more than a communist revolution, uh, was a, a nationalist revolution. Uh, 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 it's at least in its propaganda and its ideology, uh, and its uh, and its uh, the fervent that it created among the population was as a uh, uh, was as a redress of uh, what were considered historical injustices and the lack of uh, Cuban sovereignty, and uh, and the Cuban Revolution presented itself from the very beginning. As, uh, as an attempt by the Cuban people to finally uh, fulfill the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dreams and hopes of their original attempts at independence in the late 19th century. In Bautista, I know we're going to move it up into the 1930s and mm -hmm. 40s. Bautista was, I would say, actually, I think it was later in the 40s and 50s, uh, during that time, I think, um, he wasn't really a saint. Uh, no, 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 not at all. In fact, uh, there's plenty of evidence that uh, that he had been uh, uh, working for uh, the mafia for uh, since oh. he was a, a low-level um, uh, army uh, sergeant uh, in the in the 1930s. Uh, however, you know, uh, Batista was uh, was very popular uh, in the in, in during his first uh, mandate in the in the 1930s. Uh, he uh, is the one that uh, that brought about the passage of the uh, Constitution of 1940, which was a very uh, progressive Constitution. And and in fact, you know, when the uh, when Fidel Castro uh, began his insurrection, uh, the main goal of the of the Cuban Revolution, supposedly or, or officially, was the restoration of the Constitution of 1940, which was the Constitution that was brought in by Batista. Um, and he remained uh, very popular until the uh, outside of power until the 1950s, uh, when uh, when due to a, a lot of factors, not the least of which was the endemic corruption of the Cuban political system, uh, he uh, he uh, had the uh, coup d'état uh, that uh, that led to uh, the the final period, you know, the final six years before the uh, the triumph of the uh, of the revolution, and he became a sort of uh, this, um, this image of this corrupt tyrant. Uh, but before then, he was a, he was a rather important and, uh, and not unpopular uh, figure in Cuban politics. Now, if I'm correct, I think Fidel tried once before for the revolution and failed? Well, yes, in 1954, uh, the, uh, which, which is when uh, Batista's uh, uh, coup d'etat took place, uh, Fidel Castro was uh, uh, had just been elected to Congress as a member of the uh, Ortodoxo Party, and the coup d'état nullified uh, the results of that election, and uh, and Fidel figured, well, if I can't get into power uh, via uh, elections, that uh, that he was going to uh, attempt through other means, and uh, and that's where he uh, had his first uh, uh, attempt to overthrow Batista in the Moncada barracks. Uh, in Santiago de Cuba, uh, which was an abject failure, uh, and uh, and he was arrested, and uh, and sent to prison uh, for a um, I believe he was in prison for uh, almost two years, uh, 
And Batista, under international uh, pressure, declared an amnesty for all political prisoners. And Fidel was released from prison and uh, went to Mexico, where he uh, was able to raise the money and uh, the men to, uh, to invade Cuba again and begin the, uh, the revolution that, that we all know. Uh, if we only knew in hindsight, huh? <laughs> wow. So what kind of environment was being cultivated, do you think, during that time when, when Castro made his move and he was successful? Was there an economic depression going on in the country at that time? Well, I think in Cuba you can speak of, uh, of almost two economies. There was the economy in Havana, and Havana was a very bustling, uh, active place, uh, tourist mecca for the United States, uh, a, a gambling center. Uh, there was a thriving uh, music and film and television industry. Um, however, uh, the uh, provinces in Cuba, the, the rural areas in Cuba, uh, were uh, very uh, depressed. It wasn't a situation unlike that of other uh, Latin American countries at that time, where there was a very large divide between a concentration of wealth in the, uh, in the capital and uh, widespread uh, misery and underdevelopment uh, in the countryside. Um, uh, I think that there was a, a widespread uh, resentment and frustration uh, in the Cuban uh, countryside and a sense that, that, uh, that Cuba uh, had, um, that the ideals of Cuban independence as, as outlined by Jose Martí in the late uh, 19th century uh, had, been, uh, had been deferred uh, had been um, violated, in a sense, by, uh, by the series of corrupt politicians that seemed to respond more to U.S. and international capital interests and not to the interests of the Cuban people. And, uh, and Fidel and the Cuban Revolution uh, were able to, uh, to uh, galvanize uh, that popular support and, uh, and, and bring about the, the revolution. Besides the fact that the, the Batista regime was a was a weak regime uh, in terms of uh, in terms of popular support. I mean, it, it maintained itself in power uh, primarily through uh, through corruption and through uh, repression. Hmm. Doesn't sound like it was much different for the last sixty years. Right. Um, what were the Cuban relationships? What was the Cuban relationship with the U.S. during that time, when Fidel Castro <laughs> finally took over? Uh, I know we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, so obviously it was pretty tense. Right. But what do you know about that time? Yeah, that's a very, you know, it's a very fascinating and very, uh, uh, very complex time. Uh, when uh, when Fidel uh, and and the revolution first took power, um, there the official line from the Cuban government was that uh, what they were interested in was uh, was regular economic relationships, uh, uh, not a, a, a continuation. Of uh, of the uh, the relationship of dependency that had existed uh, beforehand. So Castro uh, still wanted a relationship, though. Yes, at the very beginning, absolutely, sure. Uh, uh, I, I think that that that, that was clear. Um, however, the United States was uh, was naturally very wary of uh, of what the revolution represented. I think that the U.S. government badly misjudged the uh, level of popular support. Uh, for the revolution in Cuba. I think that they viewed Castro as just another uh, dictator in a long line of you know, military populist uh, strongmen that had risen to power in Latin America and that they were going to be able to buy off the revolution in a, in a sense like they had uh, before. And it turned out that that wasn't the case. And I think that there were, uh, there were strong historical reasons uh, uh, for that. Um, and that the Cuban revolution viewed itself as having a mandate of, uh, of uh, fulfilling Jose Martí's vision of a, of, a, of a truly sovereign, independent uh, Cuban nation, uh, not colonized by the Spaniards and, and not colonized by, by the U.S. Uh, as well. And, uh, and the U.S., like I said, they, 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 I think they badly misjudged uh, Castro, thought that they could uh, bend him to their will, and, uh, and Castro had the, 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 the option at that time because of the Cold War of, uh, of utilizing the Soviet Union uh, as a counter uh, to the United States and, um, and played his cards uh, rather well. Um, you know, the break, the rupture in, in, uh, in U.S.-Cuba relations 
happened uh, soon after the revolution when the Soviet Union offered to uh, assist the new government and uh, uh, donated uh, uh, a, a couple of tankers full of crude oil uh, to uh, Castro's government. And Castro ordered the, uh, the U.S. refinery, U.S. owned refineries in Cuba at that time to refine Soviet crude. And they refused to do that. And that's when uh, Castro nationalized uh, American industry in Cuba. And that's where uh, the, the, the real rupture took place when uh, the uh, blockade was, uh, was uh, declared and where escalation, the, the real escalation came about. It's really an amazing relationship. I mean, I, I compare it sometimes to a divorce and a marriage, this bitterness they have towards each other. But I don't know too many wives that would get back together with their husbands after they've been uh, um, tried to be killed. <laughs> right. I remember right. the Bay of Pigs and, and stuff like right. that. I don't know how Fidel can reconcile that and say, sure, that's all right. I think it's a survival instinct. You know, I think that, uh, that um, beyond the ideals of the Cuban Revolution, uh, one of the great goals of uh, Fidel Castro has always been to remain in power. And, uh, and in many ways, uh, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, I think that it was always in Cuba's um, interest uh, to, uh, to, 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 to better its economic situation. And the only way that it could do that, in a sense, was, uh, was by searching out a, a better relationship with the United States. However, that being said, uh, every time the United States has tried to uh, uh, create a, a, a closer relationship with Cuba, there's always been uh, some sort of event uh, to, to uh, break the countries apart. Some people would say that that's, uh, that that's uh, by design of the Castro government. For example, Ca uh, Jimmy Carter uh, uh, tried to uh, bring the U.S. and Cuba closer, and uh, Clinton tried to bring Cuba and uh, the U.S. a little closer, and we had the Brothers to the Rescue fiasco when Cuba uh, shot the two civilian uh, airplanes uh, out of the sky. Uh, which, uh, again, escalated the tensions. So some people would say that this is a, a cat and mouse game, that, uh, that Castro's, the Castros have always depended on the uh, embargo to provide them cover for the economic hardships in Cuba, uh, but at the same time, they play lip service to wanting better relationships with the United States uh, as a way of saying that, that the bad guy is, is the U.S. and not uh, Cuba. And unfortunately, Cuba has a lot of historical evidence uh, of, uh, of U.S. intervention uh, and, uh, in Cuba to, uh, that, that provides some sort of heft uh, to those anti-U.S. Uh, arguments. Hello, my name's Matt and I'm an addict. My mom was addicted to prescription pills when I was very young, before I even turned one. Are you or someone you know struggling with alcohol or drug addiction? Has everyone given up on you or your loved one? The caring staff at Elite Care understands and treats you as a whole person. We offer individual and group therapy, holistic healing such as yoga, nutrition and spirituality, medication management, and PTSD treatment. By building upon your strengths and rebuilding broken bonds, we help you begin a successful life. With our staff of licensed psychotherapists and doctors, you can be assured of the highest level of care. Elite Care is the best option for long-term rehabilitation from drugs and alcohol. Contact 888-511-0607 for more information. I know they use the anti-American rhetoric. It was pretty famous by uh, the former leader of Venezuela, Chavez. He was known for it as well. Everybody likes to pick that one common enemy. Hitler did it. Um, Castro did it with the Americans. But do the Cuban people really believe it, or is there only a certain group that believes that? Well, you know, you have to, you have to keep in mind that uh, this anti-Americanism in Cuba didn't just appear as a vacuum, and it's not a, it wasn't a, a, a response to the Cold War. Cuba and the United States have had, a, 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 have had as intimate a relationship as two countries uh, can possibly have uh, since the 19th century. In the 19th century, the United States tried on repeated occasions to purchase Cuba away from the uh, Spaniards, uh, uh, a number of 
filibustering expeditions left from the U.S. to try to uh, invade Cuba and, and declare its independence from Spain to be annexed into the United States as, a, as another slave state back in the 19th century. And Cuban independence uh, was uh, uh, the, the first war of Cuban independence in 1895 to 1898 was uh, terribly violent. And uh, the Cuban independent, uh, independence movement never had, uh, never received assistance from the United States in their effort uh, to, uh, to gain independence from Spain. And had their victory uh, taken away from them at the final minute, uh, in, 19, in 1898, pardon, uh, the Cuban uh, independence army controlled all Cuban territory except for Havana and uh, Santiago de Cuba. And that's when the United States some would say, uh, under false pretenses, uh, intervened in that war, a war that here in the United States we're, we're told is called the Spanish-American War, but which Cubans view as uh, uh, the, the, the Cuban-Spanish-American uh, War, uh, because the Cuban independence movement was on the verge of winning when the United States intervened, signed an armistice uh, with Spain, excluded the, the, the Cuban uh, independence army, had it disbanded, and occupied Cuba uh, uh, for uh, until 1902, and then Cuba, when it finally uh, uh, gained its independence, only did so uh, after the United States imposed uh, the Platt Amendment uh, on their constitution, which gave the U.S. the right uh, to intervene uh, militarily, if necessary, if the Cuban government took uh, steps that, that the United States viewed uh, counter to its own interests. So, so the United States essentially um, uh, maintained a, a, a sort of a, a dominant relationship with Cuba throughout the early 20th century uh, that many Cubans in Cuba during that whole period uh, opposed uh, many times violently as a, as a, as a status of neo, a neo-colonial status, much like uh, what Puerto Rico uh, still, uh, still has uh, with the United States. So there was a very strong nationalistic vein in Cuba throughout the 20th century uh, that viewed the United States as a neo-colonial power and viewed Cuba as a semi-independent state. And the Cuban Revolution in many ways was, an attempt, was, was uh, ideologically presented itself not as a Marxist revolution, but as a nationalist revolution that was going to right the wrongs that, uh, that, that had taken place in the first war of independence. And the United States was viewed as as that intervening imperial power uh, in uh, in Cuba. So let's, For example, uh, people don't. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, let's go back to fast forward a little bit. Sure. I know we made this joke prior to the show. How, how are two Cubans going to talk in 20 minutes? But um, let's fast forward to today. Yeah. What do you think happened that that finally made this resolution, in a sense, this relationship? And where do you think it's going to go from here? Well, I think uh, that there was finally uh, some political will. Uh, on the part of the uh, of the White House to uh, try something different after almost 60 years of a policy that that really hasn't worked and that many people would argue has been counterproductive uh, in the sense that the embargo has always been the excuse that the Castros have used uh, for the, the lack of economic development in Cuba, which is unfair in my opinion. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I also think that that Raul who um, uh, says at least that he's going to step down in 2018, uh, sees that there's, no, uh, that there's really no other option, that, uh, that Cuba needs some sort of economic uh, growth over the next few years and, um, and viewed the, the lifting of the embargo as, as, a, as an ev inevitable uh, uh, next step in his attempt to uh, liberalize the economy if not the, uh, the, the, the uh, political uh, uh, structure. I think the Castro are, uh, are very nervous uh, about what's going to happen because nobody really knows what's going to happen. Um, and I think that the hope is for some sort of um, transition, uh, maybe the, the Vietnam model, where you still have the Communist Party in power, but a, a highly liberalized economy that has full economic relationships with the United States, that that's the sort of uh, ideal. But, uh, but no one really knows. And, you know, I think it's, it's pretty telling that, uh, that right after this announcement, there's been another uh, sort of crackdown on dissent in, uh, in Cuba. 
a number of uh, arrests have taken place. You know, I think that there's some nervousness. I think that they that they were forced into this uh, into this position, um, and uh, and they're not quite sure that they're going to be able to handle uh, uh, this sort of transition. Is it a so fair assumption? You, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, is it a fair assumption to think that they were forced into the situation because China's slowing down a little bit? Russia's taken out of the ball game right now. Venezuela's out of the ball game because all the the price of oil's dropped. It looks like a lot of their buddies are in trouble right now. Right. Well, you know, I think I think uh, I think China still represents a, a huge uh, opportunity for Cuba, but Venezuela is the main. The, the, I think the main issue that uh, that has them nervous. Uh, the, the Cuban economy depends on the oil subsidy that they get from Venezuela, and uh, the situation in Venezuela is looking very uh, very dire. And uh, and I'm sure that the that, that the Cubans are very nervous about what that uh, about what that that that'll represent for their for their economy down the road. And they figured they needed to do something quick. And also keep in mind, you know, this issue of the the Cuban spies that have been in prison in the United States. Uh, that's a huge domestic issue in Cuba uh, on on part of the government. Uh, you know, it's a big propaganda. If you remember the Elian Gonzalez saga. Back in the, in the late 90s, well, the Cuban Five, which were really the Cuban Three at this point, uh, that was their their big propaganda tool in Cuba. The, the Cuban government, they bring back the Cuban Five, bring back the Cuban Five, bring back the Cuban Five. So this also was an advantageous thing. They could they could claim that they got the they got their Cuban patriots, which here are called the Cuban spies, that they got their spies back uh, and and claim that as a as some sort of a victory. Um, so I think I think that that was that there was a number of factors in there that uh, that that brought this change about. Now whether this change is going to have really drastic and deep uh, consequences uh, in the near future, I think that remains to be seen. Most Cubans I know are very skeptical uh, about uh, this uh, bringing about any any real change in everyday Cubans' uh, lives on the island. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Lopez again for taking time out. Hopefully we can bring you back again to talk more and see how things unfold in Cuba. But before we go, this is not really a fastball question because usually they're tricky questions. This is not going to be that tricky. But I know we're going to have a lot of people starting to go to Cuba now. So what is Professor Lopez's uh, first dish recommendation if you go to Cuba? Uh, you know what? Uh, in Cuba, uh, one of the Raul's liberalization policies allows people to work for themselves. And I think you'd be surprised in uh, Havana, the number of little tiny, fantastic restaurants and uh, and jazz clubs that are only have three or four tables because that's what they're limited to by the government, that are privately owned and uh, that are on par with anything you'd find anywhere in Europe or uh, in any great capital. Havana is uh, one of the great uh, cosmopolitan cities. And beneath that sort of veneer of uh, being stuck in the 50s and looking like a bombed out uh, uh, ruin, uh, there's a really vibrant uh, theater, uh, music, uh, culinary uh, uh, world that um, I think a lot of people would be surprised. Don't just go to the, the beach resorts and, uh, and dance salsa. There's a lot of really <laughs> hip, cutting edge uh, culture uh, going on in Cuba right now. And my recommendation is make sure you get the natilla. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again so much, Professor Lopez. I know you're taking a trip out in May with your class again to yeah. Cuba. That's going to be exciting. Hopefully we can bring you back to find out how that went and how if Cuba's changed at all in the next three to four months. I'd be happy to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us as well. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, even in Havana, we are there. See you next time, everyone. And also catch our web TV show, Circle of Insight, on therapycable.com.